Isn't MDRT Speaks great? It's fabulous, right? So I want to share with you, as Ross said, a couple of ideas that have been foundational to my 47 years of membership with the Roundtable, and this my actual 40th year, which means I'm reaching my goal of member of top of the table. For those of you who want to reach the top of the table, there is only one way to accomplish this subject objective in my mind and to sustain it over the years. It's to build a good prospecting system, one that will generate consistent activity over and over. Now, the best method that I know of is the one that I've used since I came in the business, and I call it two-a-days. You see, I find two people every day who will agree to talk to me about their life insurance program. Now, every one of us can find people to talk to. That's really not the problem. The problem is zeroing in on their specific needs. And so here's how I do it. When I first meet someone I ask and I want to ask them for an appointment, what I do what every great financial advisor has learned to do. I ask a question. Roger Zener always said, when in doubt, always ask a question. It's a habit worth cultivating. Now here is a question that I learned from Tom Wolf early in my career. Would you have any objection to talking to me about your life insurance program? See, obviously you can substitute financial plan, business succession plan, long-term care, estate planning into that question. But the question is the point, and it's a hard one to reject, because most people will never say yes to a no question. So ask this question to everybody you call or meet. And once you have a prospect and they've agreed to meet with you, it's in that appointment now that you must engage in an in-depth discussion about what are their needs and what do you say. So how do you start a meaningful discussion? What do you do? You ask a question, right? And you learn to get how people think and you have to learn how to ask them how they think. And to do this, you need to ask yourself this question. What is it that we sell? Do you sell problems or do we sell solutions? See, now I've asked this question to audiences all over the world and the vast majority will say that we sell solutions. And why is that? Because our products solve problems. But remember, in the final analysis, there are only three things that can happen to most people. They can live too long, they can die too soon, or they can become sick and spend everything they have trying to get well. You see, the miracle of life insurance is that this product can solve their financial concerns. So as Ben Feldman said, as our money comes in, their money goes out. But most of our prospects don't think that way. See, they only see the costs and they are blind to the benefits. So to be successful, we have to help them see the benefits of our solution. And the greater the cost, the greater is the solution. And so we do this with a question. Think of the costs and solutions like a scale. On the one side of the scale are all the costs and on the other side are the benefits. And when we are asked to show solutions, we're asking clients to weigh the cost and the benefits. So what if they don't act? Well, what they're saying is, is that the cost is too much of a burden compared to the benefits. So what do we do? We start adding more benefits to the scale. We talk about life insurance benefits, the death benefits, annuities, lifetime income, long-term care, whatever all those products are that we sell, trying to get the scale back into balance. We tell them stories to motivate them to spend their money solving these problems. We call this pennies on the dollar. But you see, this puts us in an adversarial position. See, we're arguing with the prospect as to show them what the benefits are and compared to the cost. Is it really worth it? 
So I would like to suggest another way. This is a paradigm shift. Let's not focus on the cost-benefit dynamic. Instead, let's look at the problem. See, this is another scale. And this scale is the cost-problem relationship. And the more the problem hurts, the more pain that they feel, the more fear that's involved, then the cost will not matter. And instead of being adversarial, we become their confidant. We become their friend. So get on the same side of the table with them and find out where the problem hurts, where it hurts the most. And how do we do this? We ask questions. So when you're lost in thought, what are your biggest problems? What are your biggest concerns, Mr. Prospect? What keeps you awake at night, in the middle of the night? And as the pain of the problem increases and becomes more and more real to them, the cost of the solution ceases to be an issue. If the gain is great enough, there is no cost and they will, it'll, that will ever stop them from solving the problem. So we, our job is to help them understand all the ways they have to eliminate the pain without you. And it will soon become obvious that they cannot eliminate the pain without us. So what do we do when we're thinking solutions? We start talking about the solutions. But don't do this, this is a trap. It could cost you the sale. See, my rule is never talk about solutions until you have totally eliminated all of their solutions. And if you do this correctly, you will eventually come to a place where they'll say, well, do you have a solution for my problem? And when you start talking about how your solution will eliminate the pain, they will relax and become interested in the process. But don't do this until they ask or admit that their solutions don't work. You see, we're pain merchants. We need to be known by the problems we solve, not the solutions we sell. The problems we solve, not the solutions we sell, is what makes us referable. So people will come to you with their pain and they will ask you to help them eliminate it. So if you've done this correctly, they might even say, well, Guy, wouldn't life insurance work here? I've had that happen. What a beautiful thing when that happens. See, they've proposed the solution. So now what do you do? They've said, wouldn't life insurance work here? So we reach into our briefcase, we pull out the illustration, and we start to show them the product. The problem is, that this reinforces oftentimes the solution rather than the pain. You see, we've successfully converted the fact finder into a closing interview, but don't reach for the illustration. This is a trap. See, people only buy what they understand. And the mystery of life insurance has prevented many people from purchasing the greatest financial product in all the world. So what should you do? Ask a question. See, whenever you're in doubt, ask a question. So before you bring out the illustration, I always say, do you understand how life insurance works? No one knows how life insurance works. Maybe even some agents. So if you can explain to a client in simple terms how life insurance works, it'll give them confidence to buy the product. So the first thing I tell them is, that life insurance is based on the predictable probability of death. No one knows who's gonna die, but they do know how many and the probability of when. So assume that you have 10 million healthy 45-year-olds and you know in the first year that one out of 1,000 will die. And at age 50, maybe that increases to two out of 1,000 and then three out of 1,000 and so on until you can account for the whole cohort. The, the whole entire 10 million is dead. Now suppose that a thousand of them want to buy one million dollars worth of insurance. The actuaries can tell you that at age 40, maybe the premium is $960 to age 65. 
So that's a million dollars of death benefit that's going to result in a death claim for all thousand. So that money goes into a pool, and that pool has to fund a million dollars in that first year. So how much did your life insurance cost? Well, tell me when you're going to die, and I'll tell you what it's going to cost. Because it might cost 960, or it might cost five times or 10 times. And so the only logical place to compare the cost of insurance is at life expectancy. This is where 50% of the group is dead and 50% of the group is alive. So you have as much chance of getting on this side of the line as you do of dying on that side. So we measure the cost of mortality all the way out to life expectancy. And with every company, it has to be the same because it's a mathematical science. So 74% of the face amount has to be achieved at life expectancy, no matter how they get there. Well, what if we go out to where two-thirds are dead, the first standard deviation? Now it goes up to 119%. And if we go out to the second standard deviation, 95%, the cost goes up to 240%. I mean, who could afford to keep their insurance if they had to pay those mortality costs? So think about it. You reach your life expectancy birthday, and there in the mail is your premium notice. And instead of being for $960, it's for $150,000. Are you going to pay it, Mr. Prospect? And of course, they'll say, no. I've had them wad it up, throw it away. And I said, but what if you just came back from your oncologist and you found out you had six months to live? Now would you pay it? And everyone says, well, of course I would. So, Think about it, if you owned a life insurance company and all the healthy people were bailing and all the sick people were staying, what would happen to your, your company? It would go out of business, it would close the doors. And this is called adverse selection. And it caused all of the insurance companies in the United States to have to reorganize or go bankrupt in the mid 1800s. So they said, we have to solve this problem. So they called in the actuaries. And the actuaries got out their abacuses and their eye shades and they went into a dark room and they came back out and they said, hey, I've got the solution, I've got the solution. They said, what's that? It's the box. It says, if you put this much money in the box, the compound interest will earn enough on the cash to pay the curve. So you see, you got a choice. You either fill the box or you pay the curve. Now, you can fill the box in one year, five years, 10 years, or even over your lifetime. It's up to you. But you have to keep the box filled. Now, if this were the end of the story, it would be a great story. But unfortunately, there's a bit more when we take into consideration compliance, all right? I mean, interest rates go up, interest rates go down. So once you start filling your box, if the rates get higher, then the box can get smaller. But if rates go down, then the box has to get larger. So our job is to know how much you need to keep in your box each year to keep your box full. So in the final analysis, if you want to keep your life insurance the rest of your life, you have to fill the box. So you have a choice. You can either fill the box or you can pay the curve. What would you like to do? Now, this reaction to this story is always the same. They all, every client I've ever talked to has always said, this is the first time I've ever understood life insurance. And an educated client makes a better client. You see, our job is to tell the story. And people do what they want to do when they want to do it. And all we have to do is show them their options, and then let them make the best decision for them. So having qualified for the top of the table, I've learned to use only one closing question. And this question has led to the sale of substantial life insurance over the years for me. Do you want to hear my closing question? OK. It, go, it goes like this, all right? Mr. Prospect, 
where do you think we should go from here? That's it. That question has sold many, many millions of dollars of insurance. You see, people only do what they want to do when they want to do it. So I hope these ideas have been helpful to you. Remember, in the final analysis, you have to what? Ask a question. God bless you.